joining us today. Uh, so this is, uh, where in one hour, we'll try to do a, a quick recap of uh, everything that we announced in the two keynotes at DARPACON uh, last week. I think the, um, um, the, the full videos of the keynotes are going to be present pretty soon on the blog, or has it happened already? Yesterday they went oh, up. Oh, so yeah, they, they went up yesterday. So, so you can also watch the, the real thing, which I highly advise, because uh, there's a lot more theatrics than uh, we'll have this morning. All right, so let's start with uh, Dr. Foldy Blappers. Uh, so the, the, um, the guest of the keynote there was uh, uh, the way we improve uh, the Docker experience for developers is by listening to developers. And developers are complaining about lots of stuff. We look at all these uh, uh, issues on GitHub and all the comments that people send uh, on various channels, including Twitter. Uh, and, and, and then we just iterate uh, making the, the product better and looking at uh, uh, enhancing it detail by detail. Uh, so there are lots of different things that were improved uh, in the past uh, few months, uh, but there are two that we outlined in the keynote. The first one is uh, uh, multi-stage build. Uh, so one of the issues that uh, many developers were uh, complaining about is if I use a Docker file uh, and, for example, I'm using Java, uh, for Java I need to have a lot of dependencies in my image uh, that are tied to building uh, the, the Java application. And then in the end, in my image, if I have only one Docker file, uh, I end up with uh, like a huge image that has all these build dependencies that I really don't need at runtime. So my images are too big. Uh, the, the solution to that is something that we introduced that's called multi-stage builds. Uh, that uh, allows you to, um, uh, to use several stages in your build and in your Docker file uh, so that you can have a first stage where you have all the build dependencies that build uh, the application that you want to create. Uh, and then in the second stage, you just have the dependencies at runtime and you just copy the build artifact from the first phase. And you can have as many phases as, many phases as you want in a multi-stage build. So that looks uh, something like that. You can have several from line in your Docker file. Uh, so here we see an example uh, where I have from uh, my big build base Docker image where, for example, let's say I'm a Java guy, I will have uh, uh, the GDK, I would have Maven, <laughs> eventually I, I even like package Eclipse in some of my images. Uh, these ones are like one gig. I use that for development and for building. Uh, so then I do my build uh, uh, from that. And then I, I have a second from line in my Docker file where there it's my run base. So for a Java application, it would be uh, from uh, Java and maybe the Alpine version of it. Uh, and there you can copy and, and the, the important line is this uh, dash dash from equals zero. Uh, so the, the different from images are um, indexed uh, from 0 to n. And here from uh, the layer 0 into the slash artifact um, directory, I'm going to copy the artifact into a slash run app into my tiny run base. But I could have like many of these different layers, and each of them can uh, copy from the previous one. So this is really convenient. Uh, I'm sure many of you uh, who had this issue, usually what people do is that they have a dockerfile.build uh, that, that they use to generate the artifact and then a dockerfile that they use to, uh, to package the artifact. Uh, there are some, for, for people who are using Docker Cloud, you could use uh, pre-built hooks uh, to do that. I've been using that a lot for my own uh, applications. Uh, now, it's just one Docker file, multi-stage build, and uh, uh, it allows you to build uh, very small, minimal images uh, while using larger images uh, with, all the, um, with all the dependencies. Uh, the second example uh, that uh, Salomon demoed was um, uh, a very classic problem where you're developing your app on your desktop, and then um, you're collaborating with uh, other developers in the team, and you want to do, uh, for example, a performance test or even an integration testing. 
and, and for that, you want to all deploy uh, the same app, but to uh, a cloud swarm, for example. Uh, and the way to do that, uh, it, so in order to take your app from the desktop to cloud, uh, it's really painful today. You have to exchange SSH keys. Uh, when you want to do that as part of a team, each one of you gives to, needs to give you your their public key so that you can add them in the swarm into a special repository. You need to manage all these tunnels. It's really complicated. Uh, so. So the, the example number two of things that people complained about was, I wish it was easier to take my app from desktop to cloud. In this example, we're taking uh, Docker for Mac and to uh, Docker for Amazon, but it's true for Docker for Windows, and, and then uh, on the cloud version that we have, uh, Docker for Amazon, Docker for Azure, and uh, Docker for GCP. Uh, and we introduced something at DockerCon, which is called uh, Desktop to Cloud, uh, which does exactly what it says, which means uh, with Desktop to Cloud, we're, we're using, uh, if you have a Docker ID, uh, you can go to uh, uh, cloud.docker.com. There you can create and provision swarms in the cloud uh, uh, using the different, uh, different cloud providers. Uh, and once you've done that, you can collaborate on them, which means uh, if you have the Docker ID of one of your colleagues with whom you are collaborating, uh, when you go into the Docker Cloud user interface, uh, you can add them to the swarm that you have created, and then the swarms will just appear in their uh, Docker menu. So here you see the, the Docker menu in Docker format. There, there are new menu items in there when you're logged in. So here you can see you're logged in as Borja. Uh, and when you go to Swarms, you can see that he has access to uh, four Swarms in there. Uh, and basically, you can have access to all the Swarms that your colleagues have given you access to uh, in the Docker Cloud uh, user interface. So this is what the user interface looks like in Docker Cloud. Uh, you can see the, the various groups uh, who have access to the, the, different, um, uh, the different swarms. Uh, so do Docker um, uh, Desktop to Cloud, it's really a very convenient feature for developers to start collaborating together uh, uh, between desktop and cloud uh, on, with swarm. So uh, Desktop to Cloud is available, uh, multi-stage build and um, uh, desktop to cloud. Both features are available today in the uh, Edge release. So if you're, if you're using Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows, you can download that, uh, go to docker.com slash get Docker and pick the Edge uh, channel. All right, so we talked about Docker for developers. Uh, the second part of the keynote was dedicated to uh, Docker for operators. So once you've uh, created your app, your developers have worked on them and, uh, and they're ready to ship. Uh, now you need to ship it. And one of the very important aspects for uh, production infrastructure uh, is to have secure orchestration. Uh, so there, there was a whole part of the talk that was uh, uh, Diogo Monica came on stage and he explained how uh, uh, Swarm and SwarmKit uh, that powers orchestration uh, within Docker uh, really uh, enables uh, secure orchestration and that you need a lot of different parts to be secure in order for the whole uh, application to be secure. So this is a reminder of the Docker stack, what, what, uh, what Docker is built out of. Uh, so Docker is built out of many parts. Uh, and these different parts are different open source projects that you can use independently, but Docker assembles them together into that platform. So at the bottom layer, you have InfraKit, that's for infrastructure management. So this is, for example, in the Docker for uh, Google Cloud Platform uh, edition that we created recently, InfraKit is the layer that uh, manages your, your cluster on GCP. So it manages VMs and volumes and things like that. And then on top of that, you have um, uh, Linux Kit, which is uh, one of the new components that we introduced and that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Uh, that's the Linux layer. So you have a, a Linux operating system that's uh, a very small, uh, lean, and secure. 
uh, as well as portable. And then on top of that, we have Container D, which is the core container runtime uh, of Docker that's really running, getting images and running containers. And on top of that, we have SwarmKit, that's the uh, orchestration component. And SwarmKit itself is made of lots of different pieces. Uh, so in there, you have an in-memory RAF store. Uh, so that's a, a key value store that Swarm is using in order to store uh, uh, information about the networks and the containers that are running into that cluster. Uh, and it's using the RAF protocol uh, for the different nodes to communicate together. Or, or to keep uh, to keep this in mind who has the truth. Uh, uh, node identity, cryptographic node identity is uh, is the part that makes sure that when you're uh, when you when you have a new node joining the swarm, it has a unique uh, uh, cryptographic identity, and uh, another node or, or uh, a node from someone who tries to do some phishing attacks and just inject a new node in your network won't be able to join it. Secrets uh, is a new feature that we introduced uh, in, uh, in Docker um, uh, 17.03 uh, that allows you to provision secrets, uh, application secrets to the right nodes in a really secure way. Uh, and then running mesh is the part that, uh, uh, that routes your requests when they're coming into the cluster and they need to go to uh, specific uh, uh, services that are running, specific tasks. So routing mesh takes care of that. Uh, encrypted networking is a new feature uh, that was introduced in, uh, in Docker that allows you to create networks between, uh, uh, between the different containers that form your application that are encrypted. Uh, and then the core orchestration engine is the part that's doing uh, the orchestration, placing your containers in different places uh, in the cluster based on uh, constraints and requirements that you pass on the command line or using the API. So secure node, uh, so in SwarmKit, let's look at the various aspects that make up for uh, a very secure orchestration. Uh, first, SwarmKit, uh, the, the secure node in, uh, introduction. Uh, so each uh, each node in Swarm, uh, when 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 a, a node joins a Swarm, it has a, a, a unique uh, cryptographic node identity, uh, which blocks like nodes who don't have that uh, to uh, mimic as being part of the Swarm. Uh, so that's what what it looks like. It has uh, there's um, um, the, the the thing that is signed is the a mix of the Swarm ID, the node role. Uh, whether it's a manager or a worker uh, and a, a node ID. So that's the subject of the certificate that is, uh, that is uh, providing the node identity for a node. Uh, the other aspect, once each node is secure and you know who they are, uh, then you can start having a mutual TLS between all the nodes. And one of the beauty of SwarmKit is that the, the certificates are um, uh, are auto can be auto rotated uh, in one of the demos, not in this keynote, but in a previous one I've seen uh, Diogo just set the uh, uh, auto refreshing of certificates between nodes, <laughs> going down to like refreshing them every 30 seconds. That's a little bit extreme. Don't try that at home, but uh, but you can definitely uh, pick. Uh, uh, an interval that works for your security requirements, and you don't need to have an army of uh, uh, ops people uh, or, or very complex automation script in order to uh, rotate the certificates. It's done automatically for you. So then you have uh, so secure nodes, then MTLS communication between all these nodes. Uh, the level on top of that is what we call cluster segmentation, which allows you to uh, label the different nodes uh, and then to say, oh, these nodes, uh, uh, they, are, um, uh, they are HIPS compliant, for example. Uh, oops, I should have got my slack. Uh, so or, or these nodes have a certain type of hardware or network uh, uh, that really help with security, or these ones should be dedicated for the uh, machine learning task. So cluster segmentation helps you segment the, the task that you're deploying on your cluster uh, according to, uh, um, uh, to the type of security requirements uh, that you want to, uh, to use for that. Uh, 
And then the, another aspect on top of that, once you deploy your, your containers and your tasks and your services in the swarm, uh, you can create virtual networks for these, uh, and these networks now can be encrypted. Uh, so it's just an option you say in your compose file or in the Docker parameters when you're creating the service, you just specify encrypt for true. Uh, and then when you put all that together, uh, all these security features, and you need uh, many of these in order to make uh, secrets work. Uh, you can implement a uh, secure secret distribution, which is something that's very unique in Swarm. Uh, I think Docker Swarm is the only orchestrator today that implements a uh, secure secret distribution. Uh, and so the way it works is um, uh, um, your, when, you, when you create a secret using the Docker command line, you talk to a manager that stores your secret encrypted in the RAS store. Uh, so that's a big difference with Kubernetes, for example, when they are stored unencrypted in a CD. Uh, and then the manager talking TLS to the various nodes will just deploy uh, your secrets only on the nodes on, on which there are tasks who need them, so not on all the nodes. So if one of the nodes is compromised, not all your secrets are compromised with it, uh, like it can happen with other types of uh, orchestrators. Uh, and um, and the secret itself, it is delivered to the container uh, via uh, a TempFS file system, so it never goes to, to disk. Uh, and, it, and it can be consumed by the container without leaving any trace, uh, like environment variables do. Uh, and when the container uh, is, uh, is, uh, is killed or disappeared or stopped, uh, the secret just go away. Uh, so that's uh, uh, secrets, um, application secrets in, in SwarmKit or in Swarm, in Docker using uh, SwarmKit. And, and that feature builds on top of all the other security features. Um, all right. So, so that was a secure orchestration. Now, um, on, on the upside of things, uh, there's one, uh, one other aspect that, that, that really changed this year, uh, which is uh, Docker started its life as a Linux, um, um, as a platform for Linux containers and only for Linux. And over the past year or year and a half, our customers have asked us to take Docker multi-platform. I want Docker for X. Uh, and X was things like Windows 10 or, uh, or Mac OS X uh, on, on desktop where there's no Linux in there. Or Windows Server uh, or in the cloud, Windows Azure, Google Cloud Platform or Amazon Web Services where there's no, there's not a single guaranteed Linux uh, there. So basically we needed to build uh, different Docker editions for platforms where there was no uh, default Linux or there was no Linux at all. So in order to do that, uh, we needed a Linux system uh, that, that, that we built. Uh, and that Linux subsystem in the, in the stack that I showed you uh, looks something like that. You have infrastructure management. On top of it, you install the Linux subsystem. And on top of it, you install the container runtime. And the characteristics we are looking for for that subsystem is uh, we wanted it to be secure uh, because secure orchestration is really one of the important aspects uh, for apps deploying containers in production. Uh, we need it to be lean. Uh, that Linux subsystem for cloud, you want better density. Uh, what containers bring you is better density of workloads, so you want the uh, the Linux that you're putting on your machines to not be in the way and, and, and bring lots of load. Uh, you want a, a very lean distribution. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, if you're doing a Docker for IoT uh, and you're installing Docker on your drone or your Raspberry Pi, uh, you want a very small Linux distribution as well because there's not much hardware or storage in there. So you want a Linux subsystem that's secure, that's lean, and then that's portable, uh, because we want to build Docker, or we want to bring Docker everywhere. Uh, uh, people want the benefit of container on any type of infrastructure, and so we're delivering on that promise by building a platform that is portable, so the Linux subsystem needs to be portable as well. So secure, lean, and portable. 
And uh, we thought that uh, we are not the only one that need that. And when we, so we started building that Linux subsystem and the tools that go with it. Uh, and, uh, and then we started talking to different partners. Uh, and we just realized, hey, there's a whole, the whole container movement needs something like that. Uh, a way to build secure, lean, and portable Linux subsystems. And when talking, we talked to IBM and Microsoft, ARM, Intel, and HP, uh, and all of them needed that. And, and so, so we created that toolkit that's called Linux Kit that allows you to assemble a secure, lean, and portable Linux subsystem. Uh, and we did that in partnership with all these uh, partners as well as the Linux Foundation. So we introduced that Docker on Linux Kit which is the toolkit that we're using to assemble our own Linux subsystems for uh, Docker editions. And we think it's going to be used in lots of different places uh, by all these partners and the rest of the industry to provide a, a, a base Linux subsystem for the container movement. Uh, one of the things that was demoed at the conference is uh, 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 Microsoft did a demo, John Gossman came on stage uh, and Microsoft did a pretty big announcement there of uh, bringing uh, Linux containers to Windows. Uh, and, and, so, and, and, and so John made a demo of, of that, Linux containers working on Windows, uh, and that is brought by, uh, by Linux Kit. So Linux Kit, a secure Linux subsystem, it only works with containers. Uh, the, the reason it's secure is uh, uh, it's designed with containers in mind, and it's all designed around containers. So, because all the system services are containerized, uh, they are sandboxed, uh, it is designed for immutable infrastructure, so which means uh, when, you're, when you have a new version of, of, um, of, of that Linux uh, machine, uh, you just uh, deploy a new version and then you nuke the old one. Um, uh, and eventually the containers that need to run are run again, uh, and you can have a, a storage uh, that, that the containers store their state in, like in volumes. Uh, it provides a smaller attack surface, uh, and, and you can apply some specialized patches and configuration that really work well with containers. Uh, we think of Linux Kit as an incubator for security innovation, so some of the people at Docker has been, have been collaborating with uh, uh, some industry um, uh, efforts uh, to make Linux more secure, like WireGuard, Landlock, uh, KSTP, uh, and and our own uh, our own team, uh, Unikernel team, who's been working on Mirage OS, started experimenting with uh, uh, type safe system demons. So there's an example. Uh, in the Linux Kit code base, I don't know if it's there yet or not, uh, but there's an example of a, a DHCP uh, um, a daemon uh, that is coded uh, in a type safe language. So that's one angle, an incubator for security innovation. And the last one is uh, it's a community first uh, security process. Uh, so at Docker, we think that Linux is really too big for any one company to secure it. Uh, so we wouldn't claim that, that we could secure Linux. It's a whole ecosystem effort. Uh, and so we, we want everybody to participate in, uh, um, into uh, uh, that effort securing, of securing um, uh, Linux. Uh, and so we'll participate into existing Linux security efforts, uh, and we hope that Linux will be a great place to experiment on uh, new security innovation. Uh, so Linux Kit is lean, uh, again, it's minimal size. Uh, the size of a minimal distribution with Linux Kit, I think, is 35 megs. Uh, typically, in the Docker editions, like Docker for AWS, uh, we ship images with a bunch of drivers that go to 100 megs, but still it's, it's pretty lean. Uh, it has minimal boot times. All system services are running as containers. And everything can be removed or replaced. Once you adopt containers for everything, it's really easy to replace uh, one daemon by another. Uh, they are just different container images providing the same service. 
The last thing, Linux Kit is a portable Linux subsystem, so we want to cover all the use cases from desktop to server, Internet of Things uh, uh, to mainframe. Uh, it needs to run on Intel and ARM. Both Intel and ARM are partners there. Uh, we want it to run on bare metal and virtualized. Uh, so actually, there are some VMware people who participated to that project. Uh, this is really exciting. Uh, so we're launching, we launched Linux Kit with all these partners. Uh, we're talking to the Linux Foundation for where the best place in the Linux Foundation is for that project. Uh, and uh, that was Linux Kit. So you saw the diagram with the different stack. Uh, so you have InfraKit at the bottom, then Linux Kit, then ContainerD, the core container runtime. Uh, and then you have Swarm Kit, and then we have a bunch of system services. All these pieces of Legos uh, that we're using to assemble our platform, we needed a tool and a place where to collaborate on that. And so we introduced at DockerCon uh, last week the most important open source project of Docker after Docker itself, uh, when it was introduced four years ago, that we call the Mobi project. Uh, so the Mobi project is uh, it, it's a framework to assemble specialized container systems. Uh, what we mean by that is that it, that project was born from our efforts at Docker to have the different teams collaborating on building this different edition that I talked about. I think we have 12 of them. Uh, in order to collaborate on these different editions without reinventing the wheel, we have pretty small teams of four to five people Typically, they work for five, six months to deliver one of these editions. We don't want each of them to have to reinvent the wheel. And instead of just collaborating on the components, uh, we needed an intermediary level for them to collaborate on, and we call that assemblies, as different assemblies of components. Uh, and we needed tooling for that to happen, and the tooling is called Mobi. Uh, so Mobi provides uh, both a list of 80 plus components that you can use to assemble your distributed system. Uh, you can package your own components, you can bring them, they, they just need to be containers. And we'll provide the reference assemblies uh, for, for Docker itself, uh, the, the one that's deployed on millions of nodes. Uh, but we expect people to bring lots of more different assemblies and we think that the Mobi project will help the whole container ecosystem evolve to the next level uh, to, to get container uh, mainstream. So, so that's the Mobi project. Uh, we, Docker is using Mobi for all its open source collaboration. So we moved the Docker Docker project in there in Mobi Mobi. Uh, so there's thousands of contributors and hundreds of patches per week. Uh, there's lots of component development happening in there. So we started moving different projects in Mobi. Uh, they specialize assembly development. Uh, there are tools for integration testing, uh, architecture design, integration with other projects. Uh, and there will be lots of experimentation in Mobi on uh, bleeding, bleeding edge uh, features. So we're using Mobi for open source development at Docker, but so can you. It's a community run. It will be an open governance inspired by the Fedora project. Uh, and it plays well with existing projects. You don't need to donate your code to Mobi in order for, in order to participate in Mobi. You just can create an assembly that references your code that's part of a, that, as an image uh, that's uh, on, um, on Docker Hub and, uh, and you're good to go. So you don't need to donate your code in order to make it run uh, with Mobi. So what it means for you, Mobi is, it depends who you are. Mobi is really a tool that is designed for systems builder. So if you're an application developer and you're using Docker, continue using Docker. Uh, Docker will just, what it means for you is that with Mobi, Docker will evolve faster and uh, will be able to better leverage the ecosystem that innovates uh, uh, around containers. Uh, so Docker will just get better uh, and easier and faster. Now, if you're a systems builder, and you're interested in building your own container-based system, uh, Mobi can really help you innovate without tying you to Docker. So this is really an area where everybody can collaborate on different designs. Uh, Mobi is not very opinionated. You can bring your own, all, all the different uh, layers of the stack that I talked about, 
I, I presented you the ones that come from Docker that we're using in the Docker product. Uh, if you don't like any of these layers using Mobi, you can just replace it replace it. So you could replace Linux kit with Debian, for example. Or the infrastructure layer, you could replace uh, infra kit with Terraform if you prefer that solution. Uh, for the container runtime, you could replace container D with Rocket. So all the pieces there can be assembled uh, in a different way. Or the orchestration layer as well, you could replace uh, uh, Swarm kit with Kubernetes. And so during the demos in that keynote, we demoed how to use a Rolf, uh, 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 did a demo of uh, different systems that were uh, built uh, using Mobi and that were built pretty fast. Uh, and uh, the last demo he gave was a demo that uh, Ilya uh, from Weave created where uh, he runs Kubernetes using Mobi. So, the Mobi project helps you transform multi-month uh, research and development projects into uh, projects you can create in a weekend. You just assemble a bunch of containers together uh, into a YAML file, uh, and then uh, you just do a Mobi build to create your image, and then a Mobi run uh, to run it. So we gave a few examples. So uh, one of the examples here was uh, lockdown Linux with remote att attestation. So what remote attestation means is that uh, you're deploying a machine in the cloud, for example, with a specific version of Linux, uh, but you want it to be super secure and you want to be sure uh, that the, the bits of the Linux kernel that you're running there are really the bits that you're thinking you're running. Uh, and so you could assemble that with InfraKit to do uh, an automated infrastructure management and deployment, Linux Kit to create your uh, lean, secure, and minimal uh, Linux distro that you want to assemble there, Container D uh, that's for container runtime to run the system services on that Linux distro, and then you would use Notary remotely. Uh, a notary would check the signature of the, of, the, uh, of the images for the Linux distro that you're running there uh, and could check that at good time. Uh, so you could configure the init service in Linux Kit to have one service that verifies the signature, sends it back to uh, uh, InfraKit for InfraKit to verify. And if InfraKit uh, um, uh, didn't check that the, the version of Linux that you're running on that node is correct, uh, then in fact it could just uh, delete the node. So, so, it's re so, so that's one of the projects that actually our security team has been uh, working on, uh, and, and that's just one example. Uh, another weekend project number two uh, would be to build, assemble a custom CI CD stack. So here you just put InfraKit, Linux, in Container D, the same base. But on top of it, uh, you would put a notary for the veri image verification. You put the Docker registry, the Docker builder to build images. And there you would put Java and Jenkins uh, for the CI CD stack, uh, and maybe InfluxDB and Grafana for monitoring the whole thing. Same thing, this is a custom stack that you could build uh, in a weekend with Mobi. The third one, let's talk about uh, changing things. So Mobi doesn't force you into a specific uh, set of components. You could replace the infrastructure layer with Terraform, the OS layer with Debian, um, and this is an example of changing these. So we had a demo, Rolf gave you a demo of a different stack that he built. Uh, he built a, a fun stack that he calls Redis OS, which is a, a very small image or a, a very small Linux machine running Redis. Uh, so there it's just Linux Kit, Container D, and Redis. And then uh, to show uh, how possible it could be, uh, he just built Redis OS on his Mac. Uh, so there he, he just did a Mobi build, Mobi run on his Mac. Uh, then by just changing a line at the end of the YAML file, he said, build me an ISO instead of just running on the Mac. Uh, and that built an ISO that he could then start with Hyper-V on Windows. Uh, so the same Redis OS but running on Windows. Uh, and then for Redis OS on, on bare metal, uh, he used the, the packet um, uh, API uh, that allows him to pixie boot uh, the image that he built uh, on his Mac. Uh, but on the package.net um, uh, bare metal uh, service provider. 
Uh, and then the last example was uh, Ilya's. Ex uh, uh, actually, this one was not Ilya. No, I, I think it was still Rolf. Uh, it was HCD clustering on Google Cloud Platform. Uh, so GCP, uh, the whole, the same old stack. Uh, but there we have InfraKit providing managing different uh, HCD, uh, uh, different HCD machines. ETD running in a container, but here is an example of bringing additional third-party components that are not part of the, of the stack that we're shipping with Docker, where we brought ETD and Prometheus, and showing how InfraKit can, uh, can configure uh, an ETD cluster by providing each node the IP addresses of the, of the other nodes so that they can talk together. Uh, and then the last project was uh, on the Mac uh, using HypoKit, to start a VM on your Mac, Linux kit to run uh, Linux on top of that, Containerd on top of that, and then uh, SSHD, which uh, an SSH daemon in there, ETD, and then Kubernetes. So the, the, with just one Mobi run, Ilya from Weave built that, uh, built that assembly. Uh, I think you can find it on the internet in his GitHub repo. Uh, and with just a Mobi build and Mobi run, you can have a full Kubernetes running. Uh, on your Mac. So, uh, just watch the keynote, it's really worth it. Uh, you'll see all these uh, uh, nice build up of uh, explanation of how we, the different collaboration models that we adopted uh, with these little mice collaborating. You see them collaborating on different components as we did at Docker in the beginning. Uh, then the, the different diagrams that you see on the left, right, and, and at the bottom is uh, these, these developers started collaborating on assemblies, uh, and then the assemblies are what we use to build products. So here are the, the Docker products. So Mobi Project, uh, go to uh, mobiproject.org uh, to learn more, or on GitHub, um, GitHub slash uh, Mobi slash Mobi. Uh, to learn more about the Mobi Project, uh, we think it, it will really help take containers mainstream, uh, and there's lots of systems that you can that maybe you dreamt doing during a weekend that you can get started doing uh, right now. So that's all for the open source announcements. Again, uh, go to these videos. You can watch the whole keynote and, uh, and go to the uh, uh, mobiproject.org. Thank you. And now Betty is going to talk about enterprise. Yeah, so could you just uh, oh, yeah, you I, I have a quick set of slides. Oh, yes. sure. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Great. So with that, um, actually, let me move closer to the phone here. Um, thank you, Patrick. Um, so this is a quick overview of Docker for the Enterprise. So this is day two of the DockerCon conference and the highlight of the, uh, the announcements made at that um, day two. So first off, I uh, want to talk about Docker in the Enterprise and how Docker is actually already um, in the Enterprise. So across a number of vertical industries. Uh, we can see all these, uh, this is just a sampling of the logos to show the kinds of companies that are using Docker Enterprise Edition to do things like modernize traditional applications, um, build new microservices applications, take their applications to the cloud, as well as re-platform their entire environment. So lots of great, interesting use cases here. And this is just kind of a sampling of the companies that um, are using Docker Enterprise. And especially I'd like to highlight, you know, those are just um, customers in general and specifically at the DockerCon conference, this is, these are the customers that actually spoke, whether it was during the keynote, um, you will see in the, the day two DockerCon keynote video, you will see stories from uh, Swami, who is uh, the global head of infrastructure at Visa, as well as um, Aaron Aids, who is ADP over at MetLife, talking about how using Docker at a present edition transformed not only their infrastructure, but how they're handling applications and customer data to deliver a better experience. So these folks here, um, these logos here, are people that gave specific talks at DockerCon. And Visa and MetLife stories are available as part of the day two keynote. You can go watch that today. 
Um, but then the other sessions we'll be releasing, uh, we're, we're rapidly editing <laughs> the hours and hours and hours of video footage uh, with our production company, and those should be all uh, making its way onto the YouTube channel, um, the playlist. Uh, the, there'll be a Docker 2017 playlist um, over the next week. Um, they'll be released over time. If you just if you watch our blog or if you watch that channel, you'll get updated. There's some really great stories in there. On so if you look at folks like ADP and Societe Generale, um, they are people that um, you know deployed Docker you know, over a year ago, and we've um, asked them to come back and talk about their progress since, what else they're doing, additional use cases, and different platforms that they're moving to. So lots of really great stories. So with the Docker, um, Docker for the Enterprise, um, a key emphasis, emphasis was the um, Enterprise Edition, the Enterprise Edition as a platform, the Enterprise platform, and it's building off a lot of the things that Patrick talked about um, as part of the day one keynote because those are all components, right? They're all components and um, toolkits for different uh, capabilities and functions around uh, instantiating containers, building containers, uh, and connecting them together. What we do within the Enterprise Edition is bring those components, integrate them in, and add additional uh, functionality around integrated lifecycle management. So at the bottom, you have the container engine itself, it, with its built-in security, orchestration, um, networking, et cetera. So all that intelligence within the container engine itself. On top of that, Enterprise Edition actually provides additional management, uh, security, role-based access control around all of the stuff we lay all of the objects um, required in a container environment, whether that be images, containers, services, um, nodes, networks, um, volumes, as well as all of the people in your organization. Um, and with um, you know, role-based access control, RBAC, and things like LDAP and AD uh, support, allow you and um, you know, uh, companies that you work with to bring those together um, and who has access to what. Um, object at what time and can execute what kind of action. So this is really where that um, where the enterprise edition has a lot of value because you start to look at very large organizations with you know hundreds, hundred to thousand person teams um, that are working across a lot of very a lot of um, different services and having those all come together um, to become an application that can be deployed many many times a day even. So this becomes a lot of complex uh, management and orchestration. And all of that wrapped in usable security, right? Um, so that security that is not difficult to use, but baked in from the beginning all the way to the end of the life cycle. It's trusted delivery. So everything that happens within this platform is, is protected and encrypted. But then also, it doesn't lock you in to one specific infrastructure. So this same platform runs on a wide variety of infrastructure, operating systems, clouds, um, and um, increasingly more and more platforms. So that then these the this workflow one consistent workflow can be um, used across um, the entire across a um, diverse environment. With all those capabilities, what um, you know IT application teams and IT organizations are able to do is build a secure software supply chain. And we know that in um, in a company or in a team, there are many types of applications. There is the giant list of applications that you have inherited that have been built over um, years within the company, so the traditional app um, that you have to continue to maintain, new microservices that you want to build, or applications that you're starting to break down into microservices, and then third-party applications um, and components that you buy and integrate into the apps you have, or you take and then you customize on top, right? You, you, know, you further customize on top. Oftentimes today what happens is these all have separate tooling, separate systems um, and things and different workflows and processes around them because they're very different app architectures. The value that Docker, is bring, Docker Enterprise Edition is bringing is that it's one-to-one -one packaging um, paradigm for any type of app. Um, the great thing about Docker containers is it looks the same on the outside, but it can have all kinds of, each two different containers can have all kinds of different stuff on the inside. But on the outside, it looks the same, and it can leverage the same set of APIs and tooling to go through one constant uh, supply chain. So there's a tremendous amount of um, you know, efficiency and automation and operational benefits uh, associated with this, because the, these three categories of apps can all be packaged within the same packaging paradigm, go through a similar build and automation tooling, then be scanned and signed 
stored in the same way in the registry so that um, access is man access to the content and who can do what with the content is managed. And then operations team can use one, um, you know, one management framework that one set of policies or one set of uh, uh, kind of converged different processes um, to deploy and manage diverse set of applications across, you know, um, up, across um, data centers and public cloud. So anyways, what we're trying to do is kind of unify across all these diverse infrastructure and application types. And, you know, building a secure supply chain is great, but it's really, we really know that Docker is kind of one piece of your total IT infrastructure. So it's important that the platform itself is running on um, certified infrastructure. So this is infrastructure that, you know, when talk, Patrick talked about additions, right? We've taken that additions model all the way to at the enterprise as well. So targeting, um, targeting operating systems and um, cloud infrastructure that our customers, that we know that our customers um, depend on for their enterprise, for their critical applications, making sure that Docker is configured out of the box to work with the right drivers, et cetera, to work well within the different operating systems. Because each one has their own little nuances. Um, and then we test and validate, and that becomes certified infrastructure. Pretty common um, paradigm. And on top of that, you have Docker running on these things, but you know, it plugs into other systems, whether it be storage and networks. So the plugins themselves are now delivered as containers. So everything is pluggable and easy to consume because they're now all packaged in containers. These plugin containers, um, to be certified, they run through a um, API testing, as well as their security scan and reviewed by partner engineering here at Docker before that they are published. Uh, similar to like App Store, Apple App Store means that there has, you know, there's a level of confidence because we know it's been, there's been some, a review process before it's made publicly available. Um, similar thing here with the certified plugins. And lastly, we have certified containers, which is, you know, ISV products. You know, so it's software that's packaged and delivered as containers on the Docker store. Again, these are security scanned. Um, they must pass a certain bar of um, security profile as well as reviewed by someone at Docker to make sure they're built with best practices um, uh, for, you know, for how we recommend images um, should be built. Those all live in a um, store, in the Docker store, um, so it provides a place for the publishers, these third-party organizations, to, um, you know, see who downloaded, manage versioning and entitlement, and be able to roll out updates, et cetera, as well as for um, people who are using Docker to go there and figure out, I'd like to use monitoring, which, agent, which monitoring agents are out there. I'd like to use a, a networking plugin, what have you, and be able to see what's certified and what's not. Being certified also means that both Docker and that third-party company will provide cooperative support um, so that, um, for that container itself. So we will try to troubleshoot as well as that uh, partner will try to troubleshoot um, to figure out is it a container problem, is it a software problem, work together to find, the, find a, a solution for the customer. And all of this tested and validated against the enterprise edition. So together as an ecosystem, we're, we're um, providing assurances and guarantees that this will work and work well. And then the inter uh, ecosystem for the enterprise platform itself. So we talked about the operating systems and the clouds that this is available on, um, as well as um, we have some key partnerships on the data center side. What's exciting is last week we made some announcements. Um, and for with our partner IBM, who's been a um, kind of go-to-market product and support partner um, for Docker Enterprise for um, one of our first partners there, we're now working together to bring Docker Enterprise Edition on Linux for the Z and Power System. So bringing um, containers to um, some the, the some of the uh, data center systems that are actually running some very high performance workloads that power, you know, financial services companies and all kinds, you know, government and all kinds of, um, all kinds of companies out there. So for the mainframe systems out there that are running Linux, we are working together to bring Docker there. So again, same, same packaging, same management framework and construct, um, taking it to additional systems. Availability of Docker Enterprise Edition on Alibaba for those um, who are in, um, in uh, Asia, especially the China, China, uh, China area. And then for Docker for GCP, we have a beta out today, so be able to um, try um, using using um, a Docker uh, edition for Google Cloud, and we'll have that rolling out um, in GA for Community and Enterprise Edition too. 
And uh, lastly, announcement on the certified computer side is Oracle. So Oracle is delivering these components listed here on the Docker store as certified containers. So this is great in that people don't have to wonder, can you run a database in a container? Should I try to containerize it myself? Nope, you can go ahead and just pull it from the Docker store and get started. So there is a time, like, you know, accelerating the time to using containers as part of this. Um, they're initially starting with the developer edition and making that available for free in the Docker store, but expanding to um, the, uh, Mark Havis was on stage talking about how there will be, there'll be much more coming in this area, so stay tuned. Lastly is Modernized Traditional App. Um, this is a program that we announced. So this is both a use case that anyone can do as well as a specific program. What we have seen over the last few years is when the, uh, many customers say that they have a DevOps or a microservices initiative, but their first step is taking that existing application putting it in a container or they start breaking it up or thinking about how to change and modernize it. Um, we, have seen, we have identified various patterns um, and best practices in this um, area and also have developed some tools. So this program is uh, a packaged offer announced in partnership with Avanade, Cisco, HP, and Microsoft to provide um, end users with the ability to modernize a existing application so a mix of professional services, Docker Enterprise Edition, and access to hybrid cloud infrastructure, whether that be you know, um, Azure or access to stuff from Cisco and HP, depending on the customer's preference, um, to be able to get modernize a traditional app and start to see immediate benefits of containerizing that application um, in five days or less. So this is really about helping accelerate that time to value and providing some um, IT, IT operations team specific benefits. So even without changing any bit of the source code, driving value for the existing application with containers. The benefits of modernizing traditional apps are portability, security, and efficiency. Portable, that workload without making um, code changes is can easily be moved to uh, new hardware for tech refresh, uh, consolidated onto existing hardware, moved to cloud infrastructure, et cetera. So, um, portability is something we're all very familiar with uh, in the Docker world. Security. Oftentimes, um, you know, if a team would inherit an application that was written many, many years ago, might not have a full history or idea of what's actually inside the app or what, you know, and uh, full details um, if the original team that wrote it has moved on. What um, happens is by simply containerizing it, they're able, they're able to, by leveraging the basic um, isolation properties uh, built into Docker, is really reduce the attack surface area of that application. What, what kind of access does that container have to the host resources? What kind of calls and things are they allowed to make, et cetera, to make it just only have access to the bare minimal that it needs um, to just do, um, to perform its functions. Secondly, our secure software supply chain. By doing nothing else, these um, legacy applications are inherit the benefits of um, the Docker Enterprise Edition um, security workflow. Something like security scanning allows them now to actually know exactly what the, what the uh, packages and the components are in that, that legacy application and what that security status is. So they can proactively decide how to approach bringing that up to software compliance. Because likely there's some, there may be some packages and things in there that um, are old, out of date, or um, have some vulnerabilities. And lastly is efficiency. There is the ability to get better uh, app density on you know, cloud or physical infrastructure than what they have today. But what's been most um, interesting is from, a, from IT operations team's point of view is how much faster they are. We all know about Docker and how it improves, um, you know, makes developers faster. But IT teams, infrastructure teams are talking about how, you know, taking their applications and putting it in Docker makes them faster. So folks like Swami from Visa talked about how they're able to, um, they're now measuring provisioning time in seconds. Um, we have people like um, Northern Trust and others um, that have talked about how uh, they're seeing about 75% savings on deployment time because traditional applications often have 100 page run books on deployment. Instead of having that process with I provision a server VM, I install an operating system, I install all these patches, I then need to figure out what are all the dependencies listed in the runbook and 
If that run book hasn't been updated in a while, do I have all the dependencies in there? I won't know until I try to deploy the app. That could take lots of people an entire weekend only to have it fail. What people are finding is once they go through the initial hurdle, hurdle of containerizing that app, the Docker file itself becomes that run book. And it, be, it becomes a very quick build image and deploy. So they're seeing um, even a highly regulated financial services company, it was taking them 30 days to deploy a whole month to deploy um, web logic. It took them down to seven. And a lot of that time is actually spent on making sure some of the other um, environment, that environment that they stood up is actually compliant, um, making sure they go through their compliance checks. So 75% time savings, and now they're thinking about what else can they do in that time, all the time they've gotten back. So um, I already talked. This was, this was supposed to be the money slide with all the numbers and percentages and savings on um, infrastructure savings um, and deployment savings. But infrastructure savings, this is what people are using this for is actually for a lot of tech refresh and also seeing the use case of um, I can better manage my excess capacity for scale out or DR instead of just having it sitting around um, and not being able to plan for it appropriately. And then, um, you know, the 75% savings on um, deployment time. And so how do we look at the steps on the modernizing traditional apps? So we look at it from this kind of uh, this five image step process and the program that's been identified kind of covers the first half. And then the last, the second half is really continuing to think about um, the vectors on which to modernize. So first step is to take that existing app, put it into a container, into a Docker container, and then thinking about how do you modernize the infrastructure? Is it tech refresh, migrate to cloud, what? Uh, modern methodology. How do you integrate that and further, op uh, further gain better um, time savings through automation? Or is it an opportunity to implement new automation systems? And lastly, microservices. We're seeing three patterns. One is it's an old app. I will sunset it pretty soon anyway, so I'm just going to containerize it and get some efficiency. Second is I'm going to keep the app code as is, but instead I'm going to add some modern services like an Elk stack or modern monitoring capabilities around that. Or third, now that it's in a container, I can start thinking about using Docker Enterprise Edition and the container framework as it is to take that one big container and turn it into three, five, seven over time. And before you know it, you have a microservices application. And that is it. That is a quick summary. Um, I know Karen will probably post this um, online, and then you, you guys can go check out um, our, the Docker YouTube channel and the DockerCon playlist. Make sure you kind of watch that. There will be more um, videos posted, and then uh, more blogs coming to feature the different speakers. Yes. Thanks, buddy.